front if you want to come and there's one seat over here. Somebody wants to come in the front. OK, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to, I think, day two of Cisco Live. My name is Sujit Ghosh. I'm a technical marketing engineer, and I manage the team also in, as part of the technical marketing group in Wireless Business Unit or in Enterprise Network based in San Jose, California. I have been in Cisco for almost 19 years and in the business unit for last 10 years. And before that, I was a tech engineer working on security, wireless, all of that. That's how I started my career in Cisco. So today, uh, we're going to talk about design and deployment of wireless LAN controllers. It's a very interesting time because last week or last month, we introduced a new set of controllers and called the Catalyst 9800. I'm going to touch a little on it, what are the essential parts of the Catalyst 9800. But most of my presentation is going to still focus on AirOS controllers. So the latest software release 8.5 and 8.8. .8. That's what I'm going to focus on today. I want to make this interactive. And my session is still 1 o'clock, but I think uh, there is a lunch after that. So if you have any questions, we can uh, take those questions in, uh, during the session itself. Okay, So feel free to ask questions. So this is the, arc, uh, I would say, the agenda for today. And uh, we're going to go through the architecture building blocks and then go deep dive onto the mobility architecture, then uh, talk about some of the best practices. What are we doing for your, for the best practices? Okay, That's what the agenda for today. Probably you have seen this slide in many, many places. This is the overall, I would say, strategy for enterprise network, which is IBN, or internet-based networking, which includes, at the bottom, your routers, switches, controllers, access point, which is the heart of the network. And then you have your platform on top of it, which is the DNS center, which drives your policy, automation, and wireless, uh, and your assurance on it. Today. I'm going to focus mostly on intent-based architecture or and on the infrastructure part of it. Talk about the APs and the controllers. I'm going to touch a little on DNS Center, but there are dedicated sessions for DNS Center, uh, which are there tomorrow as well as on Friday. But I'm going to touch little on the controllers. What are we doing on the wireless LAN controllers and access points in order to send all the data to DNS Center. Okay, that's more important to understand. That's what I'm going to cover today. Say that, let's start with our architecture building blocks. To me, a wireless network starts with an access point, period. An access point and its deployment to follow the best practices for its deployment. It all starts from there. So what I'm going to talk first is why are we talking about and what is our latest access point? Definitely, what we are seeing, customers are moving towards a prevalent 5 gig implementation. That means everywhere, if possible, implement 5 gig. For example, in Cisco Lives around the world, we started making sure that the main SSID for Cisco Live is on 5 gig. Okay, 2.4 is now slowly getting reserved for IoT, for IoT devices. But for your laptop access, for your data access on 5 gig. So what are we doing for that? We're going to talk about that in detail. Then the next thing which we have introduced is what we call as intelligent capture. And I'll go through details about that during my presentation. And every access point we are coming out will have those basic features of clean air, client link, high density, AVC. That's given. It will be all there. 
But the new item to look into over here is called telemetry. How we can get some data directly from the AP itself is the new thing which we are going to talk about today. So what we have over here is a access point which has dedicated radios for 2.4 as well as 5 and also dedicated CPUs for those. But you can see I have three radios over here. All our older access points had only radio 1 and 2. Now we have another radio called radio 0. What is that? Let's talk about that. So that's all part of our latest access point, which is the 4800 series access point, which has a functionality called intelligent capture. So this access point will have support for security analysis, real-time telemetry, as well as hyperlocation. What does this mean? This is how the inside of that access point looks like. So it will have, obviously, dedicated radios for your 2.4 and 5. But it also has a third radio, which is dedicated for monitoring and sniffing and inclusion capture. This also has a Bluetooth radio right in the middle. This has your hyperlocation, which is these antennas around. 16 antennas so that you can precisely say your client is inside this particular room and then obviously it has four antennas for your high density coverage so i make a joke out of it i always say this is almost the bmw 8 series of all our access points it has everything on it it has your normal radios it has your security radio, dedicated antennas for your Bluetooth. It has your hyperlocation as well as your 5 gig radios for your high density deployment. But here is the complete portfolio of your access points. So obviously, we start with the most high end, which is your 4800 series access point, which I talked about. Then you have your 3800, 2800, and if you have situations where you're running out of budget, you don't have uh, a requirement to do high density, you can always go with our low end access points, which is the 1815 or the 1830. But definitely, if you see, this is our two flagship access points. If you are deploying a high density, for example, this is a room for high density. We have one AP at the back, and we have about 60, 70 people in this room, and everybody has at least two devices, one iPad or an iPhone or a laptop. This is an example of a high density deployment. I would highly recommend the 3800 series access points with the options of external antennas. But if you are doing a carpeted office deployment and you need uh, uh, APs which can do Bluetooth, etc., this is our recommended access point on it. And the good part is the price for both of them are same. And you get a lot more with these APs. The only reason you should be using this access point is if you are doing high density deployment. That means when you need an external antenna, that's it. Other than that, I would highly recommend if you have the budget to uh, do either of this, go with the 4800 series access point because that's where we are putting all our technologies and innovations on it. And I'll talk about that in details as we go through, okay? Similarly, we have all our outdoor APs, starting with the 1540, which is the low end of the uh, outdoor access point, then the 1560 and the 1570 access point, okay? Also, 
we added a new device in the network, what we call as a sensor. If you go to the world of solutions, you will see this in action. But what does this do? This is a small device which can be put into a wall and do some synthetic testing. I'll go through all that details later. And then also you can take one of these small low-end access points starting with 1800, 2800, 3800 or the 4800 and convert them to a sensor. So this is a dedicated hardware which can act like a sensor or this could be any of our access point which also can act like a sensor. What does this sensor do? I'll talk about that in details in a couple of slides down. Just keep this in mind. We have a dedicated hardware for a sensor or you can convert any of our access points to act like a sensor also. As far as our controllers are concerned, we have our smallest Air OS controller, which is the 3504. Then you have the 5520, the virtual controllers, and you have the 8540 controllers. And then you have for your really low-end deployments, small deployments, you have a functionality called Mobility Express, which is the same controller function available on your access points. And I'll talk about that in a couple of slides down. But keep this in mind, this is the portfolio of our controllers, what we have, okay? So if any of your customers So that's on the infrastructure part of it. So now let's talk about the rest of the architecture on it. So obviously, uh, the whole wireless LAN architecture is based on access points, which we talked about, the controllers. Then we have the management platform. It could be Cisco Prime or DNS Center. And then you have services on top of it, which is CMX or DNS spaces. If you want to see demos of all of this, please make sure you go to the World of Solutions. I made sure that all these demos are available so that you can take a look at it. Whatever I'm going to talk about today, there are team members of mine who are doing the demos in World of Solutions. Please, please stop by and talk about it. So obviously this whole architecture is based on of underlying technology of CAPWAP. CAPWAP is what we use between your access point and controllers. Let it be iOS XE or Air OS, we use CAPWAP as the transport mechanism between our APs and controllers. We support what we call as DTLS to encrypt the control traffic by default, but you have the option of encrypting your data traffic also via DTLS between the AP and controller. So this is the starting point for all our controllers and access points. And also keep this in mind, every time an access point boots up, goes through this process of discovery, <coughs> DTLS setup for the encrypted tunnel, join, then it downloads the software from the controller if the software is same or different on the APs. And if the software is same, it will directly download the config and go to the run state. Keep this slide handy. I'll refer this later in the presentation. But every time you deploy a wireless network, the key item is mobility. That means you have your phone over here, you are watching YouTube or doing other uh, applications like Citrix or anything. You want to maintain the connectivity between one AP to another AP as well as to other controllers. Say for example, we are using two controllers for a Cisco Live deployment here. As you are moving from this building to the next building, you want to maintain your connectivity. And in order to do that, we have a concept called mobility group. 
that has been there for a long time you need to put these controllers as part of the mobility group and as soon as you put them as a part of a mobility group we form what we call as ethernet over ip tunnel this has been there from day one but what i'm going to talk about next is the change which we are adding on top of this so that's uh, so by default as soon as you put say three controllers as part of one mobility group they form a tunnel between them with ethernet over ip as the protocol so that if you are roaming between these access points you can maintain your ip address you can maintain your session so that if you are watching youtube or you're doing a citrix application or any other application or on a voice call we will continue you will not see a disconnection but what we are going to talk about now is how you can do this so if you have a controller with couple of ap's in a single mobility group you can have up to 24 controllers it's pretty big and also at the same time we always support roaming between multiple controllers so if you have a software or a controller which is running 8.8 .8, you have another controller running 8.5 and another controller running 8.3 you will be able to support roaming between your controllers also we follow a strategy of n minus 2 if you have a controller at 8.8 .8, we will support roaming with the next md release or a long lived release of 8.5 or 8.3 so you can have one portion of your campus running 8.8 .8. if you got a new controller and you want to run 8.5 and you have an old controller which is running 8.3 we will be able to support roaming between all these three controllers. This is how we test it in our business unit. This is what will be supported by TAC also. But now let's talk about roaming between these new controllers which we talked about called the 98 series 100 Catalyst controller and Air OS. That is another difference which we start with in the beginning that we will support full roaming between the Air OS controllers which you had for a long time and these new controllers. How? Yeah, yeah. all right. I'll send it by Yodi. No stress. Disco office got stress cuna he He works like a symphony So here is your Air OS deployment. You had this with your 3504 or 5520 or 8540 controllers and they are running any type of software, whatever you are. And then this is your new 9800 series controller. This could be a virtual or it could be a physical controller. If you upgrade this controller, which is your Air OS controller, to the new upcoming software of 8.8 .8 MR2 coming out within a week or two, you will be able to now seamlessly roam between the two controllers. Only thing you have to do is upgrade your existing controller to 8.8 .8 and make sure that you add it to the same mobility group. But keep in mind, this is the new thing. The new thing is tap wrap. Instead of using Ethernet over IP, we are going to use tap wrap tunnels to secure those connection between your controller which is your new controller and your existing controller and because of that we are asking you to upgrade the controller to 8.8 .8 MR2 
So any of your 3504, 5520 or 8540 controller, this will be supported. But if you have a really old 5508 controller, we do not have support for 8.8. .8. But we are going to have a special image based on 8.5, which will be available via TAC. If you cannot upgrade to 8.8, .8 because whatever reasons, you can open a TAC case, and they will give you an 8.5 software, a special software, which can also do the same function. But I would highly recommend moving forward, move to 8.8 .8 for this functionality over here. Okay. Similarly, so we will have support for full layer 3 roaming between the two networks. Similarly, what we can do is we can do it across the campus also. So if you have two controllers in your campus and they are part of the same mobility group as I talked about and they have formed this Ethernet over IP tunnel between them, you don't have to touch them. All you have to do is upgrade the participating. software on one of them, your new controller, and we will be able to roam between this. Why am I asking you to go to 8.8? .8? This is the reason that this controller now can have Ethernet over IP tunnel at one hand, and it can have a CAPWAP tunnel on other hand. CAPWAP will go to... Hey, I think that uh, wraps up the Q&A for today's event. Thank you, everyone, for, to, for participating. Controller. Configure, configure, configure it. That is the reason I'm asking you to upgrade to this 8.8. .8. Hey, I think that uh, wraps up the Q&A for today's event. Thank you. Your new controller and your old controller in it. Imagine that this is one building in your campus. This is another building in your campus. But you have a new building. Or catch up. Maybe leave me. Broke bone, red liver. Swat up nebanka. You can now have that whole roaming option by upgrading one of these controllers to support this 9800 series controller. Any questions on this? Clear? And will provide configuration and troubleshooting so tips for the Nexus 5000 series. Scenario, Welcome, Lucian. Thank you. Where you had this anchor control. Out VPC. So the top switches um, would. Which is running AROS. How do you configure the fax? Uh, well, um, you go in the interface Ethernet uh, on your 5K that's connected to the fax. And you tell the 5K that this is a fax that's connected. So switch port mode, fax fabric. And you have to choose a number for your fax. So, for example, a number from 100. So, for example, fax associate 101 here. To 8 .8 MR2. Application is not performing as expected. Um, first off, think about are you using a proper design? Um, do you have you because for the VPC role? If you have additional questions, make sure that available to you. So this is another difference we made it in the architecture. I worked on this from day one. I was involved on this in order to make sure that That's time for one more, I think. Is the Jumbo MTU affecting performance if it's config configured? There's no reason why not to configure it. Support seamless roaming between the two controllers, and you don't have to replace all the controllers in your network. Just do a software upgrade and support this roaming scenarios or guest access scenario. Make sense? Question. I'll repeat it. That's okay. This one? Very good question. By default, I am not. So the question is, 
if you upgrade this controller to 8.8, .8, will it also support CapWap? Yes. So you have the option with 8.8 .8 <laughs> to go everywhere CapWap. But maybe that you might be comfortable with 8.5. You want to stay with 8.5. We are giving you the option where you can still be at 8.5 here. You can run 8.8, .8, <laughs> so we will support the link between the two. Auntie, I'm not making fun. I'm just telling you. Hey, I think that uh, wraps up the Q&A for today. Hey, I think that uh, wraps up the Q&A for today. I'm hoping that will figure it. It will not uh, be uh, affecting performance. So there's no reason why not to configure it. Because it's standard based and also it has the option of DTLS. Hey, I think that uh, wraps up the QA for today's event. Thank you everyone for, for participating. Secure connection between the two. Chai lenge? Hey. Because this is very important to understand what are we doing to make sure that there is full seamless roaming as well as guest access between the AirOS controller and the iOS XE controller. And we'll provide configuration and troubleshooting tips for the Nexus 5000 series. Welcome, Lucian. Thank you, Dan. Now I'd like to briefly outline the format for today's Ask the Expert event. Lucian will start with a short presentation on the Nexus 5000 for the first 25 minutes of the program, and then we will dive into the live question submissions for the remainder of the event. During our live presentation, you may submit a question to be answered by Lucian and a team of Cisco technical experts using the submit box on the left side of your console. Simply type your question and press submit. To see the latest questions and answers during today's presentation, be sure to click the refresh button located just under the slide. You can scroll up to see previous answers in the Because that was a uh, difficult uh, scenario which we had with Converged Access, so we got rid of that made it simple and flat on it, okay? So that's uh, the new what we have as far as the AirOS controllers are there and bringing in the new 9800 controllers. Now let me talk about little on DNS Center, but I'm not gonna focus too much on DNS Center, but what I'm going to focus on is what are we doing on the controllers in order to feed the data to DNS Center. Why am I going to recommend at the end of this session to upgrade to 8.5? My next recommended software for all of you would be 8.5 Maintenance Release 4, which was posted last week, or 8.8. .8. When to use each of them, I will talk about it in the next couple of slides. Streaming telemetry is where we are going. Why we are doing this? Because we want to send only periodic data. What do you mean by periodic data? I'll explain. And then we have structured data, as well as scalability and reducing the CPU load. These are the reasons why we are enabling streaming telemetry on the controllers. So in order to enable streaming telemetry, what we have done on our existing controllers with 8.5 is we implemented the NetConf Yang model. So now you will be able to take all the data from the controllers. That means how many clients are connected? What is the RSSI value of each client? What is the IP address of each client? Participating. Available now via <laughs> Now you will be able to get exact same information using the NetConf Yang model. Okay? What is that? Let's talk about that. So currently, if you have a big controller like 6,000 APs on it and 64,000 clients connected to it, and you have a management... And we'll provide configuration and troubleshooting tips for the Nexus 5000 series. Welcome, Lucian. Thank you, Dan. Via SNS. 
Now I'd like to briefly outline the format for today's Ask the Expert event. Lucian will start with a short presentation on the Nexus 5000 for the first 25 minutes of the program, and then we will dive into the live question submissions for the remainder of the event. During our live presentation, you may submit a question to be answered by Lucian and a team of Cisco technical experts. We have about 100 people in this room with 200 clients connected to that access point. But all of you are static. Your IP address is not changing. Most probably your RSSI value is not changing. But if you are sending that data continuously to a management platform, it puts a lot of CPU and memory on the, on the controllers. So with this NetConf Yang models, you can run a query saying that I want to know about client details whose IP address has changed in last five minutes, whose RSSI value has changed in last five minutes. Otherwise, I don't need that data. And since you are sitting over here, your IP address has probably not changed. Your RSSI value has not changed because you are static. We will not send that data to the management platforms. So now these management platforms can make specific query saying that give me all client information whose IP address has changed in last five minutes whose RSSI value has changed. So as a result, now you can make specific queries to the database and make sure that you get that data only. So that's the advantage of doing this telemetry-based model. So you will be able to do real-time notification in less than five seconds, as, as well as it will be able to give you the client application and network traffic, and also you can select what type of data you are looking for from your network. So just keep that in mind. That's the reason what we are implementing called as the NetConf Yang model on the existing controllers with the software upgrade of 8.5. So keep in mind also, if you have a SDA deployment or a fabric deployment, or a centralized, or a Flex Connect, or a Mobility Express, this NetConf Yang model will be available in all the deployment. And you will be able to feed all that data to DNS Center to do all assurance as well as analytics. But let's talk about what are the innovations we are adding in 8.8, .8, which is what I'm going to recommend one of them is definitely the real-time telemetry coming from the controllers, the sensors, which I talked about in the beginning, the hardware, as well as this new thing called intelligent capture for troubleshooting. This is to make sure that you can actually get a inline capture of the packets itself when the problem is happening. That means if your client is not getting a DHCP address, your client is failing in roaming, you want to get a capture of the raw packets between your client and the AP to find out exactly why your clients are failing in roaming or in authentication or in DHCP. So let's look into each of this in details. So streaming telemetry, as I talked about, We'll be using JSON over HTTPS to send the data from the controller to DNS Center. And we have reduced the time all the way to 30 seconds. So within 30 seconds, you will be able to send the data. So that's all available today. But with the 8.8 .8 software, we have introduced the same streaming telemetry functions on the APs also. So now... APC will also enable LACP, so feature LACP. 
CPC. Well, we'll also enable LACP, so feature LACP. We'll CPC. Well, we'll also enable LACP, so feature LACP. We'll we'll uh, configure uh, a VPC domain number. So, uh, for example, we'll pick a number, and this number has to match on both switches. So, so what we will be able to do with these sensors is couple of things. One is onboarding, network services, application experience, and connectivity test. What I have seen with a lot of customers is they have a centralized <coughs> IT organization. Your IT department could be in Mexico City, but you have offices all over Mexico, all over US, all over other countries. You might not have a dedicated IT person in your Guadalajara office, for example. But you have an important meeting coming up at 10 o'clock. You want to make sure that your wireless network is up and running. So what we are looking for is if you have this small hardware available, which is the sensor, you put it on the wall inside that conference room, and this sensor will act like a client. So this will simulate a client. And what it will do is go through this whole process of DHCP authentication, 802.1x authentication, etc. And it will send a ping to your DNS server, radius server. And it will tell you it will run a speed test and it will tell you how much of throughput you are getting at that remote site. Because most of the time, we have seen that people bam the wireless network even though the DHCP server is not working, or the radius server is not working, or the default gateway is not available, everybody blames the wireless network, right? So that's the reason what we are trying to do over here is proactively run this synthetic test, say 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the morning before your users are coming in and making sure that your wireless network is up. And if the network is down, it will say that my synthetic test is failing in Guadalajara office because it is not getting a DHCP address. We are running out of DHCP addresses in that office. Maybe the DHCP server is down, or it is not releasing the old addresses, etc. So that's what we are introducing with the with these sensors. So you will be able to check if your DHCP server is up and not, your DNS server is and radio server as well as now it can do some testing on your applications. In future, what we are doing is we are adding a client on these sensors to simulate a voice call. So it will be able to simulate a Jabber call. It will be able to simulate a Microsoft Link call to tell you what is the experience you can expect in that wireless network. Currently, it has the speed test uh, application built into it, so you will be able to run speed tests to tell you what type of throughput. And the main idea is if you don't have an admin in that remote office, you still get to know how the clients are looking or going to behave in that environment, even though you are remote thousands of miles away from that office. Okay, So that's where we are going with it. And then this is the functionality which I was talking about, is the intelligent capture. This is absolutely new, which is part of 8.8 .8 and 8.5, uh, sorry, and 8.5. What it will give you with the 4800 series access point is, obviously, we have the location capability on it, live onboarding, but also app analytics as well as spectrum intelligence and also VIP client troubleshooting. What is this? Probably you will, everybody will agree with me 
When a Wi-Fi problem happens, it always happens with your boss's phone or his laptop, right? Or a her laptop. So what we have added is a functionality of having 10 MAC addresses registered in your DNS center, and that could be the MAC address of your boss, and say that if he or she is having some problems in connectivity or onboarding or roaming or authentication, we will be able to go in and do a live packet capture of that client to see what is going on, why the roaming is failing, why the DHCP service is failing, why authentication is failing. So all of those functionalities are what we are calling as VIP client troubleshooting. We're going to really literally call it VIP client troubleshooting. That's how I, I put it in over there. It's like they are VIPs, and they are the ones always have a problem, right? And also, at the same time, we will be able to do live onboarding. What are these? I'll show you in key use cases for this. The key use cases we are looking at DNA assurance is starting with finding out how your clients are behaving in the network. Simple as that. So we added this simple trend saying that how many what is the percentage of your network is in a good condition, what is in a fair condition, and who are having a bad day. It could be any reason. The drivers are corrupted, or it could be that they are sitting in a place where there is no coverage, etc. So we have this new Sankey charts available, which will tell you. So if you come in the morning, first thing you come in and look at how is my clients behaving. That's it, OK? The second thing is basically telling you that how is your RF coverage? How is the client looking at the network? What is the throughput it can expect? What is the RSSI values it can expect? If there is a coverage hole in your network or not, you get that information from your network. And then finally, you have the intelligent capture, where you are doing in-service PCAP from the controller itself, or from the AT itself, in case of issues. That means you have a scenario where you are failing in authentication continuously, you're going to get some packet captures before the authentication starts and after the authentication finishes, and you can export that package capture directly to a Wireshark so that you don't have to walk around with your laptop in order to do that packet capture. That's the idea. OK? I, I, I can see that you have done it many, many times. So here is an example of what we are showing here is all the sessions of a particular client. It has started with authentication. It has done the association. Association starts, client de authenticated. And if there is a failure in certain scenarios, that's where you will see this red. And also at the same time, it will do the packet capture at that moment. Probably you will always agree with me that it's the boss's phone which has the problem, and the problem happened yesterday at 3 o'clock in Tulum conference room, and you have no clue why the problem happened. That's the another important use case. So you can now go back over time, say that I'm going back to 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock, yesterday and try to see what was the problem that was happening. Maybe he was failing on DHCP, or maybe he was sitting at a place where there was not enough coverage. So you will have all details available on it. So that's one of the key use cases of DNS Center to start with. Then you have the actual client experience. This is where you want to find out the health dashboard. So you come in in the morning at 9 o'clock. I've heard this from many, many customers 
they say that I want to see how many APs are up and how many APs are down. If the APs are down, you have to take care of that first thing. Because if the APs are up, your users will not complain because they have connectivity. They may not have the best connectivity, but at least they have. So first thing, you can come back and say that how many APs are up and how many APs are down. Simple. You have done this in Prime. You will have this available on DNS Center first thing. Then you can find out which APs are having how many clients. What are the top end clients on it? So that if you see that there are too many clients on one particular AP, maybe you might have to put another access point in that same area because there are too many clients in that area. And then what are the high interference? So maybe there are other APs in that area or you might have to reduce the number of SSIDs, et cetera, in that area. So this is the thing which you will be able to see first thing in the morning. You can. Okay? Then this is the part I was talking about, what we call as historic time travel. This is where you can go back and see how the client was behaving, what was the client health at <coughs> 2.30 in the morning or uh, in the afternoon, why that client was failing in authentication, et cetera. Uh, oh, laser is out. Okay. So you can clearly see that why the client is failing in authentication and over a period of time. We will be storing the data for seven days. So you can go back seven days. Hopefully your boss will come back within seven days and tell you that uh, that the problem ha occurred and why the problem occurred. And then finally, we have the part where we are talking about the intelligent capture and giving you all the details about that particular client and that particular AP. How many clients was connected, what was the channel utilization and the frame count, etc. So you can now do a remote troubleshooting in an office which is thousands of miles away, and you don't have an IT person available. So what we have done is in this network, I think they told me yesterday we have about 240 access points. I don't know the client count today, but we have deployed a DNS center in this uh, deployment itself, and a demo of it is available in World of Solutions. There are two engineers in my uh, extended team, um, Ricardo as well as Felipe. They will be doing the demos uh, in quite a uh, number of times in a day. I would highly recommend go and look into it and see what are the functionalities, the exact things, what I showed you, uh, how it is in a real life environment. Okay? So that's. So uh, what is the size of this capture? We're going to cap uh, limit it to 100 MB at this point. So the, every packet or every session which will be captured will be for 100 MB. And we will reserve a certain amount of space on the hard disk. This DNS Center platform is a pretty big platform. It's a very high-end UCS platform. So it will have terabytes of data to be uh, uh, implemented. But we're going to f start flushing out the data for the old ones, but each packet capture, each session capture, we're going to restrict it to 100 MB. Okay. Finally, the use case uh, which I talked about is the sensors, where you will able to create those uh, uh, what we call as synthetic tests and uh, find out what is happening in your network, what is the throughput, latency, as well as your uplink throughput, downlink throughput with the help of those uh, packet cap uh, uh, with the help of those tests, as well as you, what is the packet loss from your network. This is something every customer asks about is packet loss. How can we find out how many packets are getting dropped in the network? So this sensors will be able to simulate those functionalities with the help of the speed test, etc., and give it to you. And finally, obviously, all your application performances like your DHCP, DNS, onboarding data, and if you have defined some IP SLAs, we will be able to get those data from the uh, sensors also. So these are some of the key use cases for DNSE 125. 
But in order to enable this, I'm asking you to upgrade to 8.5 MR4 code, which is already available on CCO, because of this Netcon Yang models, which we have implemented on the controllers in order to send this data much faster but intelligently. That means we don't just send the data for every client in the network. We just send it for those clients whose, for example, data has changed in last one hour, etc. Clear? But if you are using the 4800 series access points, you have to upgrade to 8.8. .8. So that's what I'm recommending, that if you are going to deploy the 4800 series access points and you want to take advantage of this intelligent capture, et cetera, on it, you have to upgrade to 8.8 .8 software. But otherwise, you can stay with 8.5 MR4 also. Okay? Any questions before I switch gears and talk about other architectures? So the question is, do you need a router between the wireless LAN controller as, uh, and the DNS center? Uh, the answer to it is, if you are doing app experience, that's when only you need the router to find out how is your WebEx traffic client behaving or a linked traffic behaving. If you are doing only app experience, you need the controller on it. But if you are just monitoring your regular uh, wireless services like DHCP, DNS, etc., on your network, you don't need a router in between. If the controller can directly feed the data to DNS center, and we will be able to show you all that. It's only for app experience to see how is your WebEx call doing or link call doing. That's when you need a uh, ISR 1K. So switching gears, uh, Mobility Express. We talked about this briefly. Mobility Express, again, is designed for really small branch offices where you have a requirement of, say, four or five access points, or maybe all the way to 100 access points. You don't want a physical controller in that. So you can convert one of these APs to act like a Mobility Express controller and have other APs join that controller and they, again, as I said, it is, could be a small office or a s distributed office or a distributed enterprise, what we are talking about. We have pretty much support for all features and functionalities on Mobility Express. So whatever you're going to get on a physical controller, you will be able to see them on the, on the Mobility Express also. Mobility Express can also support all the new things which I talked about, intelligent capture with DNS 1.3 as well as ARS 8.8. .8. So we are making sure all the functionalities and features are available on this. Here's a list of all the features. I'm not going to go through this. This is for your reference. All these slides will be available. I've already given it to uh, the team. So all of this will be available to you to take a look. But here is a qu quick look at the scalability number. If you just have a small 1815 access point, that itself can act like a controller. The scalability is you can have another 50 APs join that Mobility Express controller, and it can scale up to 1,000 clients. Take a look at this. A lot of customers are looking into this deployment worldwide. Because if you have a situation where you don't have the budget to put a controller in that branch office, you can always take one AP, convert that into a Mobility Express controller, and you can manage it from Prime, or you can manage it from DNS Center, and take advantage of all the features you have. As you grow towards the 3800, the scalability numbers are different. It can scale up to 100 APs and up to 2,000 clients, okay? So now let's look at some of the deployment uh, options on it. What you need to focus on? RF planning, optimization, HA, and AVC and control. These are the key areas 
we are focusing in the business unit. We are making sure that every software release is detailed, tested on all these functionality. And I'm going to walk you through in all of them. So first off is HA. HA is a given. Everybody who is deploying a wireless network now, these days, is starting with a HA deployment. That means you have a redundancy in your network. There are two types of redundancy. One of them what we call as N plus one redundancy, or what we call as a combination of APSSO and client SSO, where we are doing full redundancy in this case. So we have support for both of them in the controllers. What is N plus one redundancy? This is where you have one controller, which is in your data center, which is your backup controller, and you have three other controllers in your network. If you lose one of these controller over here, all the APs are going to fall back to your backup controller. N plus one redundancy. We have this for a long time. A lot of customers have implemented it. In order to make sure that this is working fine, make sure you add the IP address and the, and the, and the uh, name of the backup controller. You can tweak some of the heartbeat values in order to make sure that as soon as your primary controller is down, the AP detects it and falls back to the backup controller. This is simple what we have for a long time. But what customers are deploying now, and what I'm going to recommend is use the AP SSO and client SSO functionality or stateful switchover between the controllers so that you can now have full redundancy. So what we have in this case is you have an active controller and a standby controller. They are connected over the redundancy port and they are syncing the configuration and software also, and they're syncing the database. That means you have an AP which is connected to the primary controller. All that AP information will be also shared with the backup controller. And if you have a client which is connected to the primary controller, that database is also shared real time with the backup controller. So if you lose your primary controller, and it will send this keep alive information, and the backup controller now will send a gratuitous ARP to your upstream switch, and now this upstream switch will start sending all the AP session as well as the client session to your backup controller. So now you can see that you are still maintaining the same IP address as well as the session information, you will see hardly a drop in ping response, as well as you will see that you can continue on your voice call, your users will not know what is happening at the back end. So if you're really looking for a deployment, like in a hospital, or even in a university campus where wireless is the primary medium of access, I would highly recommend doing this implementation of SSO. And what we have done is, for this backup controller, you don't need to buy any licenses. You just buy the hardware and have it available for your deployment. That's one thing which we have done. You don't have to buy any licenses. You buy licenses only for your primary controller. When this failover happens, the license kind of gets transferred to the backup controller. All you have to buy is the hardware for the backup controller. Question. Oh, good question. So if with the uh, in an N plus one redundancy, yes. So, so you will be able to fall back from a 5508 controller to a 9800 series controller also and the same APs will be supported. And we are trying to make sure that the AP software, which is on the AP on, on the 5508 controller, is also at sync so that when it falls, it doesn't need to download the software. OK? Yes. 
8.8, okay? But the problem is 5508 will not support 8.8. .8. You have to go with 8.5 in that case. So this is what we are talking about as a pairing. So you take two 5520s and connect it back to back uh, for an HA pair, or 8540s as a back to back HA pair. We have the 3504 controllers, which will support, which also supports the HA on it for your small branch office or deployments. And also at the same time, if you have the 9800 platforms, they also can be back to back connected. But the only uh, the advantage on this is now it has that fiber port, so that now you can use the re redundancy port over fiber. You can extend this as part of two different buildings. That's the enhancement we have done on it. This is all the gig, gig as well as the uh, SFP port. We have now extended, as I mentioned, this AP SSO and client SSO functionality to the cloud version of the controller. That means if you have a ESXi deployment or a KVM deployment of this controller with the Catalyst 9800, we will have full support for AP SSO and client SSO. So you can have two instance of VM of the Catalyst controllers and you can make them talk to each other and form an uh, HA pair. So if you lose one of these VM instance, we will be able to fall back to your backup VM instance also on the network. This was not possible with AirOS. This is the enhancement we have added in the Catalyst 9800 software with iOS XE. You have support for AP SSO and client SSO with VM appliances. Clear? Okay. So that's the reason I would recommend again for the newer deployments, download this software. This software is free. It comes with a 90 day license. So you can deploy this in a network, small network, and deploy this in a lab environment, etc. Another very important function we have added on the 9800 platforms is a config translator. That means in the platform itself, we have added a functionality where you can take the configuration from an AirOS controller and put it into the Catalyst 9800 controller. It will convert the config automatically and put it onto your controller if you want to. It will show you for each and every line of configuration on AirOS what is the corresponding configuration on iOS. And if you like them, you apply them, or if you don't like it, you can make changes on your own and do it. But you don't have to do each and every line of configuration. It will convert all the configuration. Because you know iOS configuration is a little different than AirOS configuration, so it will take care of that. And that translator is built into the box itself. Uh, uh, some of the deployments what we test out in our uh, offices is we connect them to a VSS pair. So we can have two controllers connected to two different switches as part of the VSS pair. We do connect it uh, separately also. So those are tested with the 3504 controllers as well as the 5520 controllers. So all of these are recommended. We do test out with HSRP also. So make sure that uh, we, um, we have a redundant network support on it. The configuration of it is very simple. Just single box saying SSO, and you add apply the uh, redundancy management IP address, and that's it. It'll. But the main thing is you need to make sure that you're using the same hardware type. You have to have 25520 or 23504 or 28540. You cannot mix and match. One last thing I want to always uh, make keep an uh, eye for is when you have that redundancy link, when you have two controllers and they are deployed in two different buildings, make sure that the redundancy or a round trip time between the two is less than 80 milliseconds. Because otherwise, if it is more than 80 milliseconds, 
you will see a flip-flop happening once it, this will become active, this will become active, or this will keep on happening because of the, uh, of the timers which is configured on it. So make sure it is less than 80 milliseconds of round trip time between the primary and the backup controller. Okay. So let's talk about what we are doing for RF optimization. We have this concept of AP groups everywhere. It's been there from day one. By default, every AP is part of default AP group. If you do that, then if you have an SSID called employee, you have two redundant controllers, and you have multiple buildings in your network, all you have done is created a VLAN of slash 21, and it is all available across your network. So you have a flat network in your. But what happens if you have to increase the VLAN capacity? Here comes Christmas. All your students go home. They come back with new iPad or new iPhones. And it becomes a nightmare for you saying that they have more devices in your network. But Cisco's recommendation is that don't go beyond slash 21. Before beyond that, it becomes difficult to manage. So what I'm recommending is to divide this slash 21 into what we call as AP groups on it. So what we have done is now created three different VLANs with slash 23 or something like that, and said that these group of APs are going to have an IP address from VLAN 60, these group of APs from VLAN 70, and this group of APs from VLAN 80. So what we have done in this deployment, for example, we have a separate AP group for the world of solution areas, separate AP group on this building as well as different flows. So as a result, when you are part of these APs over here, you are getting an IP address of VLAN 60. When you are in World of Solutions, we are part of VLAN 70 and 80. And tomorrow, if we see that we need more IP address, we can create a VLAN of 61, 71, and 81, because a lot of our attendees are having much more uh, uh, a requirement for IP addresses. We can just add it to this group, this group, and this group without doing anything to your network. All we are doing is now VLAN grouping. So we will be able to assign IP address from a round robin fashion from. So if you have a deployment like this, comes January, and your students are coming with more devices, all you have to do is create a VLAN 61 or a VLAN 71, or a VLAN 81 associated to the group so that now you have much more IP addresses available in your network. Take a look at this. This is what customers are deploying worldwide. How you do this, I have walked you through on this thing. You have your SSID called employee. You create an AP group called employee associated to VLAN 60, 70, and 80, and put those relevant APs as part of that VLAN. Along with AP groups, we are highly recommending is associate what we call as RF profile. This is very important to understand. As your wireless network is growing, a wireless network in the world of solution is completely different than the wireless network inside this room compared to the keynote area. The RF environment is completely different. In this room, you might decide that we will have 2.4 as well as 5 gig available. But usually when we go to and do a deployment in the keynote area, we turn off 2.4 at completely because we want to keep at 5 gig, keep the environment clean. So what we are uh, suggesting is creating what we are saying different RF profiles. And if you do different RF profiles, you have the option of changing the data rates. You have the option of uh, configuring certain high density parameters as well as load balancing. Okay? This is what we use in our keynotes everywhere in the world. Whenever we do a keynote deployment for Cisco Live, 
or Mobile World Congress. These are the configurations from there, where we say that disable all data rates for a high density deployment below 30. We don't want anybody to connect below a data rate of 30 because we have enough APs available so that the coverage is dense enough. So that's an example I'm giving you. But in case of a carpeted office, you can have a, a, a data rates beyond 11 also uh, available, but for high density in a keynote. So what we are doing is creating certain types of what we call as profiles on it. So there are three types of profiles which is available, high density, typical, and a low density environment. So these are already available to you if you want to use those, or you can create your own profiles and associate them to your different uh, AP groups over here. So for this AP groups, I have two VLANs available, 6061. If you lose, we will do a round robin of assignment of IP address from here, and then you have your RF profile associated to this. Imagine this could be this classroom or this floor over here. Imagine this to be the world of solutions. And this could be your keynote area where you have disabled 2.4 completely, disabled the low data rates completely so that you get a better performance over here. And you have two VLANs available or three VLANs available because when you are sitting in a large environment, you might have thousands of clients connected to it. You have a lot more VLANs for those client devices connected to it. So again, best practice, recommendation, what we use everywhere is the combination of RF profiles and AP groups. It will make your life much more simpler to manage. And in addition to this, what we are doing in now in a lot of Cisco lives around the world is implemented this functionality called FRA, or Flexible Radio Assignment. What is this? This helps you in converting a same AP, which has a 2.4 radio as well as a 5 gig radio by default, which is 2.15, to convert it via software to dual 5 gig. That means in this room, if you had three access points, you can say that one AP is going to be only on 2.4 and 5. The remaining two APs, I'm going to convert them into dual 5 gig so that you have more channels available on 5 gig. 5 gig is much more cleaner so that your clients can get performance on it. That's what we are doing in all our high density deployment. If you are specifically deploying in a school or a, or a university where you have a classroom with 200 clients or 200 uh, students on it, each of them having two or three devices, I have seen that customers are going for this implementation where you are taking five APs in that classroom, enable dual five gig on three access points, and left only two APs to run on 2.4 as well as 5 because you have much more channels available on 2.4 and it's much more cleaner. Okay, so that's what I'm recommending. So you can do the flexible uh, assignment via auto or manual. So you have the functions of either going in and manually converting certain APs to act as a dual 5 gig or you can do it automatically, let the system configure it for you. It's up to you how you want to configure that. Take a look at this. We have started using this everywhere and specially applicable for high density deployments in a conference room, in a theater area where you are expecting a lot more clients on it. The good part is now pretty much every new client which is coming out have support for 5 gig on it. There are hardly any clients available other than IoT devices, which is only working on 2.4. But pretty much all the phones, any kinds of phone, obviously the iPhones and the Samsung phones are on the high end of it. 
other vendors also, everybody is sending, uh, supporting 2.5 uh, gig on it. So you will be okay with deploying dual 5 gig in certain areas, okay? So that's uh, another recommendation or best practice I would recommend. Either do manual, and these are all available on the 2800, 3800, and the 4800 series options, the con uh, option of converting the APs to dual 5 gig, okay? Another option I'm talking about is DBS, or what we call is dynamic bandwidth selection. So are you going to use a 20 megahertz channel or a 40 megahertz channel bonding or an 80 me megahertz channel bonding? Again, my recommendation is if you are deploying in a carpeted office, you can go with the 40 megahertz channel bonding. But if you are doing a high density deployment, we highly recommend to stay with 20 megahertz channel bonding because you have much more APs available you are putting much more channel usage over there. Do not enable 20, uh, 40 megahertz channel bonding over there. And all of this, again, can be configured in your RF profile. So the RF profile which you have configured for your keynote is going where we will tell you that do a 20 megahertz channel bonding. But if you are having a key, uh, channel bonding or a different RF profile for this floor, keep 40 megahertz of channel bonding uh, etc. So this is something which is available on the controllers for a long time, but again, as a best practice, I would recommend that enable this channel bonding either 2040. Frankly speaking, I have never seen a customer anywhere in the world using 80 megahertz of channel bonding or 160. We don't have enough channels available. The technology allows it, but practically nobody has used anything beyond 40 megahertz of channel bonding. So that's all uh, we have on the RF part. What are we doing on the infrastructure part of it? Let's talk about this quickly. We have what we call identity service engine, which is all doing great work of identifying devices, et cetera, what type of OS is running on it. But a lot of customers came back and said that, I already have a radius server. I cannot upgrade, uh, uh, move towards ICE. Can I do some s native profiling on the controllers itself or not? So we are looking at the OUI information of each and every client. We look at the HTTP header packets coming from your devices, and also we look at your H DHCP request. And with the basis of all that information, we can now say that what type of devices you are using in your network. For example, we know your MAC address, we know your OUI information, we have your device type based on that. We can say that, oh, looks like this is a iPhone, looks like this is an iPad, looks like this is a Mac OS device or a Microsoft device. And now what we can do is we know that if it's a student or a teacher connecting to the network, we know what type of device they are connecting and now we can say that, ah, we're going to apply a separate VLAN, a separate ACL, a session timeout, a separate QoS, and time of day. Meaning that you can say that only students are allowed to access the network between nine and five in the daytime, but your, all your teachers, they have full access to the network throughout the day, something like that. And you can say that you can apply a separate VLAN for the students so that they can only go to the internet. They cannot access anything else in your network or maybe one or two servers in your network. But the key idea over here is that you have now about 234 profiles which is natively available on the controller which helps you in identifying what type of device you are running on your network. So it will be able to, so if you enable two small check boxes on an SSID called DHCP profiling and HTTP profiling, we will be able to now find out what type of operating systems, what type of devices you are running in your network. It will tell you if it's an Apple iPhone, Microsoft Workstation, Apple devices, Android, etc., on your network, okay? So that's very important to know. 
what we have done is we have associated that with application visibility and control. That means now you know that what type of device you are running. Are you running an iPhone or an iPad? And now we want to find out with ABC that what type of applications you are running. That means are you using Jabber? Are you using Microsoft Link in your network? And then give priority to your data. So you can say that I'm going to give priority to my media as well as my video file transfer. I'll give a little lower priority. Or if you decide, I want to drop this. That means I will say that file transfer via Microsoft Link is not allowed in the network at all. So you have those functions available. So where we are going with this is you can say that depending on the device type, depending on the user, we can say what type of applications they can use. For example, you have a teacher and you have a student. They're connecting to the same SSID, which is called classroom. But what you are saying is, if a teacher is coming via iPad, we are going to allow her or him to do YouTube, Facebook, Skype, and BitTorrent, for example. But if the student is also using an iPad, we are going to say that we're going to separate, give a separate role to that device, which will block Skype and BitTorrent on your network. But the key over here is you're using the same SSID. So now at the backend radius server, we will be able to detect that this gentleman is using an iPhone or an iPad. You're using a Mac OS device. And you are from the different groups employees or contractors, for example, and you can push a separate profile over here to the controller, and the controller will now say that I'm going to allow these applications or stop these applications on it. And this is becoming very common these days because as a best practice, I'm recommending that reduce the number of SSIDs you're deploying. Have one single SSID enable 8021x authentication on it and make sure that you have all of them available on one SSID itself. Other thing we have done is on the controllers, we have integrated the controllers with OpenDNS or an umbrella. So what we can do is now do online monitoring of your traffic to avoid malware, etc., or, uh, or detection. So what we are doing is the controllers are now are integrated with umbrella. So as a result, every time there is a packet a DNS request coming from your uh, con client, we replicate that DNS request and send it to a umbrella in, uh, a cloud information. And if you have created a profile saying that they are trying to go to some site which could be affected by a malware or etc., we will get the DNS uh, uh, response and we'll pass that DNS response back to the client if they are compliant. But if the client is trying to go to a page or a malware site which has been detected by Umbrella, we are going to send a DHCP uh, blocked uh, message to the client. As a result, the, DHCP, uh, uh, the DNS response for that client will be dropped and redirected to a web page saying that your connection is being blocked because looks like your machine is infected, it is trying to go to a malware site, etc. on it. So what we are doing is, from the controller, we are sending a copy of that DNS request to Umbrella or, uh, or uh, uh, OpenDNS, and we are matching it with your profile, saying that, is it a student? Uh, is he or she trying to go to certain sites which they should not be going to? And depending on that, we send a response back to the client or we send the block image and redirect that client to a web page saying that looks like you are trying to go to a site which is blocked by the company policy, etc. Okay? So look at this. 
The next area we are focusing on, again, is the idea is reducing the number of SSIDs, PSK. So if you have a deployment where you are doing PSK SSIDs so that you have a separate PSK for your IoT devices, separate PSK for your employees, etc. we want to reduce that. We want to reduce those number of SSIDs. So a lot of customers are saying that for all my IoT devices, I have a separate SSID. For all my operational devices, I have a separate SSID. And for your other devices, for example, employees and all, I have a separate SSID. We are moving away from that. What I'm recommending is one single SSID for PSK. That means you create one SSID with PSK key on it, you enable Mac filtering on it, and you enable AAA override. Now what we are saying is in ICE or any RADIUS server, you create three groups of devices. One of them is for IoT, one of them for sensors, and one for your employees. All you have to do is for all your IoT devices, add the MAC address of all your IoT devices in the database and associate that with the PSK of say AABBCT. Similarly, for sensors, take the MAC address of each and every sensor and put it into a group in your radius server and assign a private PSK of X, X, Y, Y, Z, Z. But for your employees, you don't register them at all. So how this works is when all your IoT devices come to your network, we will look into the MAC address of that device. And if that MAC address is registered as part of that IoT group, via Cisco AV pair, we will send the PSK key back to the access point so now all these devices can now start using this PSK key of AABBCT. Similarly, if there is a group of sensors coming into your network and those sensors are registered with their MAC addresses, we will send a separate PSK key of XXYYZZ of it and assign them on it. But if your employees are coming and their devices are not registered, in the network, but they know the PSK key, so there's no attribute sent back to the uh, controller, they will use the default PSK key, which is configured on the SSID, which could be one, two, three, four. So all we are saying over here is, you have one single SSID, and in that single SSID, you have a default PSK key of one, two, three, four, but if you have a group of devices which are registered with the radius server, you can use a separate PSK key for those devices. So this is basically what it is helping you is reducing the number of SSIDs. You could have had one SSID for your employees. Now you could have deployed a simple as a separate SSID for your sensors and a separate SSID for IoT devices. All I'm telling you is reduce that number of SSIDs. All you have to do is go and register those devices onto your radius server or ICE or any radius server and assign a separate SSID for them. This is where the industry is going. Why? The advantage for this is if somebody steals one of these cameras or sensors, all you have to do is go to your radius server, remove that MAC address, and you're done. That user will not be able to come to your network. Or if you lose one of your IoT devices, could be a small sensor, somebody has taken it. You just go to your radius server, remove that radius uh, entry for that particular MAC address, and you're done with it. But the key advantage over here with identity PSK is you are reducing the number of SSIDs which you are deploying in your network. So my goal is you should have only three SSIDs in your network. 
one for your employee, which is enabled with 802.1x, one for your PSK devices for all your IoT devices, and the third is going to be your guest SSID, open SSID with some type of web authentication on it. So identity PSK is supported in all of this. To summarize how this security segmentation will work is you create one SSID in your network, okay? So you create one SSID called enterprise SSID. Now you are doing the segmentation saying that depending on the username and password that is used on these devices, we're going to assign VLAN 10 for all your employees, for all your contractors, we're going to assign VLAN 20. And then what we're going to say is we're going to associate them with a different role. Even though they're an employee, in Active Directory, we can say that they're part of the sales organization or marketing organization, or they are a role of contractor. And once you assign them a role, what we can say is that we can control what type of applications they can do also. So we can say that we're going to mark their WebEx traffic, we're going to mark their Jabba traffic so that they get better performance or priority when they're doing a Jabber call. But for all the contractors, I'm going to drop YouTube. So any contractor which is coming to your network, I'm going to not let them any YouTube in their network at all. And then you can say, so you can say that YouTube is blocked for all the contractors and also for marketing people, if you really don't like them, just block their YouTube application also on it. And then you can say on top of it, that you can create some MDNS policy saying that all these people, marketing and sales, can access your Apple TV printers and iTunes, but for your contractors, they can just access only printers in your network. You can do that also and apply what we call as umbrella policy on top of it. For those, you can say that you are going to block certain device uh, network for the uh, for example, Facebook, etc. I want to block them, but I will block eBay, for example, for marketing and sales folks. You don't want people to be using eBay when they are in their uh, offices, etc. So now you, uh, the, the key over here is you have one SSID called Enterprise SSID, where you have enabled 8021x authentication, and depending now on what type of credentials they are using, either they are part of a contractor or employee, you can use segmentation on your network so that you can say that they are part of this VLAN, they are part of VLAN 20, you apply a separate ACL and different policies on it. This is where the industry is going towards so that you can have only one SSID for your employees or contractors in your network but depending on their credentials on radius server, you can do the segmentation. Make sense? Okay. So this is what we are testing with. This is all available on the controllers. Uh, if, let it be an AROS controller or a 9800 IOS XC controller. All of this is uh, supported. And this can be associated with TrustSec, with SGC policies also, with so that you can apply a separate SGT value for those devices also. Final thoughts on it is uh, IPv6. So we have support for IPv6 for a long time. So now we are seeing a lot of deployments happening. This was IPv6 was very common in Europe and Asia, but I'm seeing a lot of deployments uh, with customers uh, looking for IPv6 deployment for wireless networks as we are running out of IP addresses. Probably you know, if you go to any ISP now these days, they will not give you any more IPv4 addresses. They are only giving you IPv6 addresses because they are running out of IPv4 addresses. So that's the reason I'm seeing a lot of interest from North America and uh, that uh, the customers are looking for IPv6 deployment. 
quick recap on that IPv6. So you can now configure a controller with an IPv6 address also. And also at the same time, your clients can also support both IPv4 and IPv6 clients, as well as these CAFWAP tunnel between the AP and the controller can also be created over IPv6. Uh, so you will be able to configure your controllers to access for Telnet, SSH, HTTP, everything with a V6 IP address. So all management functions on the controllers is supported over IPv6. We have some customers who have already deployed this for certain network. They're using IPv4 for the CAPWAP tunnels. For the new networks, they're using V6 for their CAPWAP tunnels. So you can now have an AP with only a V6 I address and form that CAPWAP tunnel to the same controller over V6 itself. So you can have certain controllers with V4 and certain controllers with V6 address. Even for HA, you can configure the controller, the primary controller to use V6 address. Your backup controller could be still using a V4 address. So the APs can now, when they fall back to different IP addresses, they are different controllers, they can either use V4 or V6 in their network. We do have support for guest access also over IPv6. So if you have a client which is only using uh, v6 address in their uh, devices, we will be able to support guest access or web authentication on v6 also. And with IPv6 comes first hop security, which includes uh, RA guard or source guard as well as the DHCP server guard. So all of these IPv6 security options are built into the controllers. You can enable them. Some are enabled by default. But there's a de uh, detailed deployment guide. Take a look at it if you are looking at options of, uh, of IPv6 deployment in your uh, new networks. Final topic, branch office. There is a dedicated session on branch office today at 2 o'clock if you want to listen about it. A couple of options, obviously, to start with if you have a deployment where you are only having controllers, four or five APs, you can always deploy Mobility Express, or you have the option of deploying a small 3504 controller. Or the third option, what we are looking at, is a FlexConnect deployment. That means you have one centralized controller, and you have multiple APs on those remote sites. So you can scale up to 100 APs per remote site, and you have the option of what we call as data traffic switching. That means you can move all your traffic back to the central SSID if you want to. This could be your, all your employee traffic. But for your guest traffic, you can keep it locally onto your local internet connection. So it's almost like split tunneling. You can say,